الحمد لله الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى جل جلاله وعلم نواله والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد My dear respected brothers, respected ulama, respected sisters here uh, It is about 3.30 in the night for me so um, if I go off somewhere please please do forgive me uh, For you it's is it Friday night, Saturday night? The night's young still. So, mashallah, you guys seem, all seem to be raring to go. Uh, make some dua for me, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Mufti, Mufti Muhammad Sabi has covered um, a very important aspect of this. And we were both given the same topic. And then we decided that he will, inshallah, cover the aspects of the differences between sectarian differences between um, the various different uh, groups and uh, that different Muslims uh, adhere to and um, have some kind of um, inclination towards and so on and so forth. I, th I thought that after he does that, inshallah, he's covered that angle, I would probably broaden it out and speak about more social issues because we are uh, the human being. Every one of us is a social animal and uh, there are a number of issues that we deal with, a number of differences of opinion and I think etiquette and an approach to, the, uh, approach to those things are extremely important. So now, firstly, I think let's put this in perspective. We live in, we live in what has been considered in Arabic as the alam. The alam, everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes under the, the title of alam. The alam is everything that indicates towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, towards His magnificence, His magnificence, His beauty, His, uh, his creative power and uh, his grandeur, uh, his, uh, his, his greatness and his generosity. And uh, the one thing that is a characteristic feature of this alam, if you look around, if you look at the universe today, if you look at the world, I mean, just, just the fact that I come from a place where it's 3 o'clock at night, right, 3.30 at night, and here it's not like that. Here it's, you know, minus 2 to minus 8 or whatever it is, and somewhere else in, you know, maybe in California it's, it's different. We, the, this entire dunya, this whole macrocosm, you know, the cosmic system, it's the characteristic feature of it is ikhtilaf, is difference. And that's the beauty of it. You know, the whole thing about the versatility of this universe, the beauty of it, that which makes it not so boring, that which makes it everything in it unique in its own kind of right. Each one of you and us sitting here is unique in, its, uh, in their own way. And that's actually the kamal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the complete perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he's able, to, he's able to create all of these billions of just human beings. Every single one of them different with a unique feature. And that, that's what it is. And I think we need to really realize that ikhtilaf should not be this ikhtilaf, this difference. Right? This, uh, we, we can actually turn it around in a more positive sense and call it like a, a positive feature of, of uh, uniqueness in each individual. I think we need to realize that that's something that we need to celebrate. It's not something that we need to make a difference of opinion. And that is why until, for example, just to carry on that topic, although I don't want to speak about that topic, but just when, when you don't think it's a difference of opinion, when you, don't think, when you don't think it's a problem to have four madhabs, then it's not a problem. But if you think it is, then it is a problem. And I think it's really, it really has to do with how our hearts work, you know, how mean, uh, how mean people are sometimes, right? How, how tight-hearted they are, where they don't have much room in their heart for others, where they're not accommodating enough. And I think that, that that's, it's really what, what it boils down to. Otherwise, you, you have some people, they've got such a, such a big difference of opinion even between being masculine and feminine, being men and women, and that's why they're trying to even break down those barriers. Sometimes you meet, you meet a Muslim brother, where are you from, brother? He says, I'm from the dunya. <laughs> I'm from the world. See, he refused. There's one individual I spoke to. He refused to say he was from Kashmir. You know, not because he doesn't like Kashmir, but he's got this idea in his mind that when you when you when you relate yourself and attribute yourself to a certain area, then that means you know you're doing something un-Islamic. That goes completely against the Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that we created you, right? 
شعوباً وقبائل لتعارفوا سورة الحجرات that we created you in various different tribes from different backgrounds native backgrounds so that you could recognize each other now now you know that if if somebody for example from um, a place where they, they don't eat hot food right if they come to your house and you eat hot food in your house and you give them hot food I'm telling you they're gonna go right in the face they're gonna be sweating I mean you've seen this and they just won't be able to eat and if they have to eat out of embarrassment right you're torturing them Likewise, if you go to somebody's house that, that doesn't eat hot food and they give you bland food, right? Well, what's going to happen? It, th that's what I'm saying. We have to celebrate this. That you have to realize that, okay, this guy, this person comes from such and such an area. This is how they eat. Let's cater to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِتَعَارَبُ You can recognize each other. You can recognize their customs. You can, you, you, you know, you, you can cater to some of these things. Because... This dunya is, is, is based on this ikhtilaf, it's based on this difference, it's based on this versatility, it's, it's, it's amazing actually. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a number of verses, كَانُ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ, فبعث الله النَّبِيِّنَ مُبَشِّرِينَ وَمُنْذِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent messengers that both gave warnings and they also gave glad tidings. And the reason is that even our psyche, our uh, uh, e e even our uh, psychic system works differently. In the sense that some people are, are more influenced by warnings from Allah, exhortations. And some people, they, 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 like, uh, they, they like more the promises and the glad tidings and that's what spurs them on. And the prophets did both. The messengers of Allah, uh, uh, they, did, they did both. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this that if, if he had wanted, he could have created this entire world one the entire ummah one in, in one ideology but then you know the, the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't mean that to be wise so for example let's just imagine that everybody was the same you wouldn't need translation right you wouldn't need translation you, there would be no tourism because every place would be the same just like you go to America except a few cities every place is the same you go in and there's a there's a Wendy's and there's a a, a days in and there's this and there's that and it's like where do you go in America? You know like seriously when I was there, where do you go that's gonna be different? Except the natural places, but every city is just like the same cookie cutter kind of different. I mean London's a bit better man. <laughs> anyway. But imagine it that if everything was the same, I mean what would be coming up a plant or something like that? It, 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 it's, it's just not the way it is and that's the macrocosm, that's what we are, we're microcosmic individuals that live in that. So we have to realize that people are going to be different. Two brothers are different, three, ch three sons of the same mother and father are different. But they have to get along, that's what the issue is. Now in terms of, if we, if we just move along because we don't have much time, um, there are primarily three different reasons for why people have differences of opinion. Why people are stubborn about their opinion. Why they're not able to accept somebody else's opinion. And first and foremost, I think it has really to do with incomplete or shallow knowledge. It's just a limited amount of knowledge. I mean, you, you have the strangest example under, uh, examples under this category. For example, once some scholar, and they all, they, they all say, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, and this is a weak hadith. In this weak hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, the scholar must have said it this way. Person stood up and he said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam cannot say a weak hadith. You know, my Prophet doesn't say weak hadith. I mean, he didn't say the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said a weak hadith because the person has no idea about ulum al hadith and that. We can say the Prophet said this, but it's a weak hadith according to our transmission. If somebody has no idea about that, they, they, they're going to get up to maybe, uh, if that's enough, please, it scares me, I'm a bit camera shy. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, brother. Um, so, the person just has no idea. So he's like, La hawla wa la, that's blasphemy. How can you say the Prophet said a weak hadith? My Prophet was not weak. Now you can understand that this person is emotional. You know, we celebrate his emotion. But it's misplaced, it's wrong, it's ignorant. And that's what the problem is. So I think we need to really understand this. For example, a foreigner, in the days gone by, he went to Arabia for Hajj or Umar. And he 
uh, go going through some of the outskirts of Makkah or Medina, he heard an Arab singing and the guy didn't have a very good voice. So he says, now I understand why Islam prohibits music. <laughs> now seriously, isn't that, well, that's ignorance. I mean, now he's going to go back and think, well, we sing a lot better. This, this, this should be celebrated, right? That was bad music. That's what the Prophet Allah heard and that's why that was prohibited. That's all ignorance. It's all ignorance. And you can take that, I mean, that's an absurd kind of story that all of us can laugh at. But I'm sure, you know, at one time or the other, we may approach issues in this way, right, in the same kind of way, where we think we know it all. And that's what the problem is. I mean, there's numerous examples, there's numerous examples about shallow knowledge. I mean, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ If you don't know, just ask the people of uh, remembrance, just ask the people of knowledge. هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Those people who know are not equal to those who don't know. Those who don't know are not equal to those who know. There's a difference between them. And there's a massive difference. It's a very important difference. Knowledge is extremely important. That's why whenever, whatever preconceived ideas we have, especially if you haven't studied the deen for 10, 15 years, if you, if you have a question about your deen, or if you have a confusion about what somebody said, we need to consult. We need to consult. Consult a few different scholars if you have to, just so that you can get a rounded understanding of that. Then maybe you have an authority to speak to a certain degree. Otherwise, if it's just, just through... It's just basically through your preconceived ideas of what you've been brought up with, that that's highly problematic. Because the majority of Muslims today have not had a formal Islamic education. A formal Islamic advanced education. The most that majority of our education, the, the, the limit that, the, uh, that the, our Islamic education has gone to, is nowhere close to the kind of secular education that the majority of us have studied. Think about it. The amount of Islamic education that we have had in a formal level, right, covering the different disciplines, the area of study that we conducted in our undergraduate or postgraduate, I'm sure that our Islamic education is nowhere close to that, for the majority of us, especially the professionals. And that's why it's very important that we realize this. Most of us have had a basic assimilation of Muslim ideals like namaz parna, roza rakna. And that's about it. That's why when I was talking to one person and... Uh, I think the discussion was about Sheikh Ahmed and he spoke, he had some tapes on Dajjal and the Ajuj Majur and this guy was just like, there is no such thing. I mean, this guy is a, a grocery shop owner, right? No, no offense to grocery shop owners, but I'm saying that that's all he's been doing all his life. You know, he came from India to, to America and he's got a grocery shop now, right? I don't think he's had any, any, any extended knowledge. And he's, he's rejecting, he's completely, absolutely just outwardly just outrightly rejecting the, the, the existence of the Dajjal and Ya'juj Ma'juj. Whereas it's mentioned in the Quran. And why? Just because they sound mythical and he thinks there's no myth in Islam. And that, that, that's his piyas, you know, that, that's basically his logic. That's his premises put together and that's the conclusion he gets. And he thinks it's an absolute apodictic proof. And that, that's, that's why we really need to understand that, that's very important. The second one, not to belabor this point too much, the second one is following caprice and desire. That's another reason. A person may not be ignorant. He may know very well what's right and what's wrong, or what could be right and what could be wrong. But he fails to pursue the correctness. He fails to uh, confess to it. He fails to acquiesce to it. He fails to agree to it because it's about lowering yourself down. Because he wants to be seen as the winner, the person who wins the battle. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns such people by saying, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّفَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَىٰ أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّفَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَىٰ وَأَضَلَّهُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ وَخَتَمَ عَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ وَجَعَلَ عَلَىٰ بَصَرِهِ غِشَاوَىٰ Such people who know, and despite that, they decide to follow their whims and desires, right? Being oblivious to the truth, despite the fact that they have more knowledge than that, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it such that He will veil their, their senses the sense faculties will be veiled. And he will be misguided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will misguide him. And this is really serious because pride and arrogance doesn't work and that's how shaitan went out of the fold. That's what made shaitan what he is today. Pride and arrogance. 
in this category, there's numerous things. I just, I don't even know where to start. You know this whole thing about mother-in-law, daughter-in-law? This is where it comes into. It comes into this one or the next, the, the, the next one. The next one is about following culture and uh, following your culture and tradition. Because that's how I live with my mother-in-law, you must live like that as well. Now let, let's put this in perspective, seriously, we need to look at this in a very holistic way. Because I don't want to be one-sided about this. Right? We really need to understand this. You know, back about 50 years ago, about 70 years ago, many of us came from, uh, especially immigrants, those who come into this country from India, Pakistan, Egypt and other places, we've come from very closed societies, sometimes uh, villages, which people for centuries had lived in that same area. In fact, in some houses, uh, in, in some homes, uh, they, literally there were three generations living in the same house because you, you just didn't have enough to, to spread out. In fact, I've seen a house where uh, from the grandparents to the, to the grandchildren all slept in the same big room and that was all there was and there was a kitchen. Right? And I'm sure some of you can relate to that. So it was quite simple for you to just get married to your neighbor or for you to get married to the person, you know, maybe at the end of the village or two villages down, three villages down, but that was about it. You didn't really go beyond that. Nobody wanted to go beyond that. That's just the way it was. The children had a, you know, the children were fine with it, the adults were fine with it, and it just worked as a system. Now you come to Toronto, you come, you come somewhere else, and you know, you come to the West where you've got people just converging from all different, different places around the world, literally. I mean, just right now, if we, if we, if we, if we count the villages that are, uh, the villages, the towns and the cities of the various different countries around the world that we represent here as just this group tonight, right? I'm sure we can easily pick up 30 different groups, right? Minimum, 30 different groups, each with their own different background, different ideas, different uh, foods, different customs, culture, etc., so on and so forth. Now you expect to do the same thing. I went into, uh, with my family, went into a, friend's, uh, a, a, a family that I'd known for a while, and literally, on the wall, now we know that they've got a 12-year-old son. They've got a, they've got a 12-year-old son. But they had, a, they had a girl's picture on the, on the wall in the kitchen that was of, of a girl that did, we'd never seen in the family. So, you know, we asked, who, who is this? They said that this is actually our son's future wife. She's in Pakistan. I mean, the poor guy probably doesn't even know, or maybe they, they're grooming him for that. But th 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 there's this thing that you have to be married to such and such a person. But I think, as I said, it was, quite, it was a good system. Back home, it was a good system. Does it work here? It worked for some people, but it won't for others. And if it's not working in your house, then don't force it, because it's, it's going to cause great disagreement, great problem, and that's going to be in the family. It's not even with another mother here. It's within the same family. We need to put it in perspective. I think this is where ignorance comes in. Adherence to culture, blind following of such a thing, right? We really need to realize that. If you, if you want, if we want our children to get married to a particular person or a particular family member, we need to be preparing that from before. We need to be speaking to them. We need to get them on that idea. You can't spring it up on them when they become 19 or 20, when they've already got their ideas. They've probably already got someone. They may even be secretly married or halfway there. Right? This is, this is what's going on. What happens nowadays is that many of our young children, they're already doing stuff out there. They've already found someone or they already think they have someone. Right? There's already emotional attachment. Should I ask how many people have emotional attachments here? <laughs> and, then, and then suddenly uh, the father or the mother suddenly decides, hey, but you need to get married now. Right? And we've got this really good girl and he's like, what are you talking about? It just doesn't work sometimes. Sometimes it does. And it works very well. And sometimes it doesn't. We need to realize, is it going to work or it's not going to work? If you think it's not going to work, don't force it. You can try it. You can encourage it. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? And I will tell the children as well, I will tell the young brothers and sisters that try to go with your parents in terms of your choice in marriage so that everybody is happy. But if it's not going to work, if it's not going to work, then the parents really need to also look at what their children want. Because that, that's going to be the new family unit, not the mother. Seriously, I've got a person in London today that I know. He spends four days with his wife and he spends three days with his mother. 
Meaning, he goes and sleeps at the mother's house. Because she feels that this wife is such a threat. There's such an ikhtilaf that the only way to compromise, he'll either have to divorce his wife, he's got two kids, he'll either have to divorce his wife, right, and go back to living with his mother, and she'll be telling him, get married, get married. So it's like she wants him married, but then she doesn't want him married. It's just this very strange system. It's just this very, uh, very horrible loop that he's in. So he spends four days with his wife, and three days he sleeps at his mother's house. A, one woman said, and you know, this is an educated w woman, this is an alima. I mean, her thing was that I did not want to get married to somebody in India. She's from India, or uh, parents are from India. She's born in England. She said, I did not want to get married to somebody, uh, somebody from India, and the reason why I didn't want to do that is because I wouldn't be able to respect him. Why? Because I could speak English properly, and he would not be able to do so. As a wife, I need to be able to honor and dignify my husband. And if I felt that he was lower than me in that regard, because I knew the way this, this country worked, then I wouldn't be able to respect him. And she was honest about it. You know, that, that, I think that's a fair point at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day, it, you know, you can't help those feelings. You can try your best, but you can't help those feelings. And I think as parents, we need to start realizing that. Otherwise, these ikhtilafs, they destroy our community. These differences of opinion destroy our communities. That's why if we want to, in a particular way, we need to prepare for that. We need to get our children on board from before and convince them. Give them some slack as well. Then it may work out. But if it just suddenly happens all of a sudden, and then suddenly our children want to do something else, it's, it's just a massive ikhtilaf. There's cases, again, in Islam, the wife is is the wife is entitled to a separate place of her own. What I mean by separate place is that if the person is of medium uh, 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 earning and medium standing, the wife is entitled to an apartment, which means at least a room and a kitchen that's independent from anyone else. So it's a place where it's self-contained, even if it's a studio flat, right? That's the minimum that she is actually entitled to. So she can't be forced to stay in a house with the parents. If a woman chooses to stay with the, uh, with, with, with the, uh, with the in-laws, she is doing a great service, she is doing a great khidmah, and she is being immensely rewarded if she is doing it with sincerity. It's a massive undertaking. Believe me, it's a massive undertaking, and there's a great source of reward for it. Some people can do it, some people cannot. Right? The best way to deal with this issue is that if you are parents who want something like that, then that should be your condition in marriage. It shouldn't be that you tell them all, oh, it's all going to be rosy and all the rest of it, and then when you bring them, then you force them to stay together. That's not going to work. That's deception. If that's your priority, you need to make that clear. And don't think it doesn't work. It still works. I know people recently who got married, the woman is not even from... You know, not even from any kind of religious background. Like, she's not even very pious, didn't even cover her hair before, for example. Right? If that, you know, that, that, that's one way of looking at it. And she was prepared to make khidmah of the parents. She came into the house, she's making khidmah of the parents. It happens. There are, there are you know, good people out there that, are, that can do it, that are willing to do it. But we can't force everybody to do it because it's not a requirement. The husband, wife are a separate unit. In fact, on the Day of Judgment, everybody is going to be an individual. In this world, we still have, we still have familial ties. But we need to realize that the children, when they get married, they become a separate unit, a semi-autonomous unit. And they, be, they, they have to stand on their own feet. The khidmah has to stay. There's been so many cases where there were massive problems, ikhtilaf, in the house. But as soon as they separated, close by, separate, independent place, the love just grew. The love just grew because it just, each, each of the two parties want to make it work. But within the same place, they just can't. There's just too much going on. They just can't do it. And one needs to realize that. So, the following of personal caprice and desire. Somebody just told me recently that, you know, for example, some people just want their own desire. 
They want their own desire to, 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 to be fulfilled. They don't, they're not considering the other person's desire. That's when these kind of ikhtilaat happen. That's when these kind of differences take place. And then it doesn't work out. And it's misery for everybody. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forewarned about. He said that, وَإِعْجَابُ كُلِّ ذِي رَأْيٍ بِرَأْيٍ The amazement of every opinionated person with his opinion. And that's talking about opinionated people, right? With their opinion. Their amazement with it. That it has to be the way I say it. Now you have to remember, the person who's right all the time, he celebrates alone. That's the same. The, play, the person who's right all the time, celebrates alone. That person is never going to celebrate with others. He's going to celebrate alone. He always celebrates alone. Now the third one is obviously following custom, a custom and culture which I've already kind of spoken about, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again, He speaks about the in, invalidity of this. Right? By saying that, قالوا, uh, when the Quraysh used to say that, قالوا, إِنَّا وَجَدْنَا آبَاءَنَا عَلَىٰ أُمَّةِ وَإِنَّا عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ مُخْتَدُونَ That we found our forefathers on this. And that's what we're following. And it makes it very clear that, for example, somebody like Amr ibn al-As, who later became a Muslim, a great, great Muslim hero, in fact, afterwards. He said that when I went to Najashi, because he was sent by the people of Makkah. He was sent by the people of Makkah to, uh, to Negus in Abyssinia to bring back the, 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 the people, the, the Muslims who migrated there, because he was well connected with the, you know, with, with the leadership around the world. So he said, I spoke to my friend Negus. I spoke to him because I had some... I had some relationship with him. And Ja'far gave his speech. And he says that at that moment, Islam, the idea of Islam crept into my heart. But I couldn't let go of my culture yet. Many, many of them, this is what happened. They just couldn't let go. Because there was this thing about culture. I mean, Abu Talib kept it until the last moment. He refused. Despite the fact that he supported the Prophet This is the uncle. He supported the Prophet, he protected him. In fact, he was put away for three years, along with the Prophet, and the whole family was, despite the fact that he didn't become a Muslim. But he refused. He refused. And this is complete adherence to our culture. And we have this today. There's a complete adherence. I mean, we've got this thing where people have come, the first generation, where they've got a lot of culture. Right? And I don't blame them having culture. I mean, you know, culture is what you came from. You know, we have a culture, everybody has a culture. But the problem is when you try to impose that on someone who can't accept it. So for example, if the culture is that you have to get married to a, you know, a liar or a doctor. <laughs> You've heard of those, right? Many of us check with a liar. A liar. A liar. Doctor. The liar one is better, the big liar. <laughs> if there's any lawyers here, I'm just messing around. I'm not talking about you, you're a lawyer. We're talking about liars. <laughs> so, it, it's just this thing, and the, and the poor child, I've had so many of these young students coming to us at university, go, go to give a lecture that we don't want to get married to, you know, uh, in the culture as such. We want a Muslim. Well, I said, this is a Muslim, but we want a Muslim, a practicing Muslim. Not, we don't want some career-oriented person which is going to be focused on getting his next suburban. <coughs> you have suburbans here, right? Yes. You don't have them in England. Yes, I miss them. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's something that we need to really, again, another thing that's very important. It's about the culture aspect, and I think I've, I think I've, I've spoken quite a bit about that. The thing is that it's extremely important that we become united as both as a family, then as a community, as individuals. Because what it says is that unity is very important. If people get united, they will succeed in their endeavor, even if they're non-Muslim. And we've seen that happen. And if the Muslims are disunited, then despite the fact that they are believers, they will lose and they have lost. That's why unity is extremely important. And unity can't happen on a grand level, on a country level, if it doesn't happen within our own families and our own communities. We can expect and we can curse the Muslim leaders and the Muslim countries not doing enough for Palestine. But seriously, 
if we were in the position, if one of us was sitting as Husni Mubarak down there, what would you do? What would we do? Seriously, with all that pressure that you got on you, what would you do? That's something to think about. That's why I think we really need to, I'm not, I'm not justifying them, but I'm just saying that it's a reflection of who we are at the end of the day. Right? How willing are we to stand up for the truth and to do things in the proper way according to the Sunnah? In our own small lives, where there's not much pressure, except a bit of culture. You know, the big uncle might say something. You know, for example, I proposed for somebody to someone else. They're both Gujaratis, right? But one is from a certain caste and another one is from a certain caste. And I proposed to the father, I said, look, there's this really nice boy for your daughter. He said, look, I don't mind, but the big uncle, my big brother, they're going to start talking. <laughs> that's bad enough. The guy was a nice car, the guy reads wonderful. But that's not good enough because the talking is too much. Who's to blame, the father or the uncles? I don't know. Somebody's to blame. At the end of the day, that's what it is. It's just this, this pressure. Deen is extremely important. Deen is extremely important. And as I said, the best way is to actually, if we go back to that marriage, the, the whole marriage issue, is to actually make a mutual decision, a consultation. Each person give a bit here and there. Nobody be too stubborn. And we try to meet somewhere in the middle, and everybody is happy. That's the way to do these things. Always when we approach an issue, let's look at the way to deal with an issue. If we know that the person is not going to listen, for example, if somebody is even doing something absolutely wrong and we know that if they're not going to listen, for example, you've got a brother or a sister, you've become all pious suddenly, right? You've extended your beard, you've started wearing a hijab, niqab, whatever it is, and your brother or sister doesn't do that. If you start to give them nasiha day in and day out and start condemning them and everything else, you're going to put up a wall in front of them. According to Imam Ghazali, Imam Bajuri, and many of these other scholars that have dealt with this whole Amr bin Ma'room and Nahim Muntaf issue, They've made it very clear that there are certain etiquette to be followed. The hadith which says that when you see a wrong, you change it with your physic, when you change it physically. Otherwise, with your tongue, otherwise think bad of it. The hadith itself is giving that leeway there. Because not every situation can you actually do something physical. But one thinks, takes it literally and thinks we have to, everything needs to be physical. I need to go in and smash this and the other. And it doesn't work because at the end of the day, we don't have the other person's reform in mind. What we have in mind is a literal following of this hadith. And that's not what the Prophet ﷺ told us to do. He told us that reform is what's most important. For your brother to love for them what you love for yourself. There's a way about attaining that. Otherwise you will put up a barrier. <coughs> it's very important to realize that you can try it out once. And try to give nasiha. You give it slowly, slowly. But if you give it every single day, they'll never want to come and see you again. They won't want to come in front of you because they know what you're going to say. So there's a way and a tact about, uh, in, in doing these things. The other thing is that, going back to something that Mufti Sahib said as well, which is that we need to make excuses for people. We need to make excuses for people. And I think we don't make enough excuses. We just take it at face value and then we just put a judgment on them. <coughs> In fact, what happens is that if we've got a valid difference of opinion about a business issue, about a masjid running issue, you know, within a committee, for example, you know, the notorious Muslim um, masjid committees, right? And throughout, you know, wherever you go, there's, this, uh, there's this, this constant thing. So you've got a difference of opinion with someone, or a mother, you know, uh, you're running a school, or whatever it is, or a family. What shaitan wants you to do is, that's what shaitan wants as an impetus to, uh, to create more discord. So what shaitan does is that he takes that issue and then he makes you get personal. So now you're looking for character assassination. You're looking for characteristics of that person that are weak, that are, there's a defect. And then you'll bring those into the equation. They have nothing to do with the issue. You'll conflate the matter. And that is absolutely wrong because what it is is that even if you've got a valid difference of opinion, even between two fuqaha, you're not allowed to get personal. The hurma, the hurma of a Muslim still stands there. The hurma is the person's honor. The honor of a Muslim, isn't that still there? Just because somebody holds a different madhab than yours, does that mean his honor goes down the drain? For example, uh, a scholar was giving a talk about something, and some people in the crowd what, that followed different ideology, they didn't like what he was saying. So one got up and protested. Right? This wasn't the Israeli ambassador in UCI. This was a scholar that was talking about something 
and somebody gets up and pro and uh, and protests. The sheikh, instead of responding, he sat down for a moment immediately, and you know the whole crowd is just wondering what's going on. Then he stood up and he said, "I just hope, brother, that your akhlaq, uh, sorry, your ilm is better than your akhlaq, that your knowledge is better than your than than your uh, than your conduct." Because seriously, what are we doing here? You are destroying the person's hurma by doing this. Got a difference of opinion? Go and speak to them. Person is not talking about kufr that you have to get up and, and just talk and, and, and scream. People become zealous. People become overly zealous. And then they begin to break the hurma of somebody else. And this is what shaitan wants. They want it that you start with something and then you go into something else. And it's the only true pious people that realize the boundaries of these things. In fact, you know what some people do? I've even seen this happen. It was where this can happen in two different issues because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when the ignorant people confront them, they say assalamu alaikum, they say peace. They again they take that literally. And I've seen people where if they disagree with someone, the person tries to engage them, say assalamu alaikum brother. He says this in such a belittling way. He says in such a belittling way that, Salaamu Alaikum brother, you're ignorant. It's just the undertone is there. That's not what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said. He said, come out of it in a peaceful, I mean, that's not what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala means by that. I'm sure the idea is that, you know, you come out with the peace and you just mock them and put them down and just carry on. I mean, that's not the way. It's about a peaceful exit. And likewise, I've seen this happen. I saw this in Ramadan, where, you know, it says that if somebody comes and tries to argue with you in Ramadan, you say, brother, I'm, I'm fasting. Right? And we're fasting. You should say, brother, we're fasting now. We shouldn't talk about it. We'll talk about it later. That's the way to do it. Brother, I'm, fast, uh, I'm, uh, I'm fasting right now. I can't argue with you. It's just not the way to do these things. When meanness comes into it, you see, Shaitan wants to exploit the meanness in a person. And he will use these small things. And the person will use the ahadith and the verses of the Quran to their advantage when, when, when it comes to this. The best way is to talk to a person. You got a problem with a person, sit down and talk. Because if you don't, then even when you come to salat, for example, there's a person that comes to the masjid, when you're playing salat, shaitan is going to give you ideas, oh, well, you got this point against that person, you got this point against that person. Your entire salat is wrecked. Because it's especially the masjid politics, especially Ramadan. And the best time for shaitan to drop his bombs is just before Ramadan, before he gets into, uh, before he gets into captivity. And it's got the moon issue. <laughs> <laughs> it's the biggest weapon of the shaitan, cluster bomb, just big time. Because just before Ramadan, before he's going to get locked up, shaitan, the moon issue comes about. And that's it, you come in the masjid for the next five or six days at least. You're thinking about your arguments, you're reading up on it, rather than getting into the worship. And then when shaitan comes out, it's the Eid issue, and it makes you destroy your, uh, whatever you manage to do at the rest of Ramadan. That's just the way shaitan works. We must realize that the way to counter these things is to have a broad heart, is to open up ourselves a bit, and to agree to disagree if that's what you have to do. Where if you absolutely passionately believe about something, to be true and something needs to be corrected, there are ways to go about. Think, what is the best way that I can do? What is the best method I can adopt to get my point through to them? Because if that's not the point, if it's just about itmam al hujj if it's just about establishing your proof against them, then really there's no benefit in that most of the time. That only works sometimes. That's only beneficial sometimes or called for sometimes. If you find that you're a person who finds faults in people all the time and you're never satisfied with anybody, then you've got a problem. There's some people that are just like that. With everybody, they've got an issue. There's something or the other. The thing is that, really, in all, in all honesty, in all reality, each one of us has some defects. And if somebody went around, he'd be able to find 10 defects in me and, you know, 5 or 10 in everybody else. But that's not what we've been looking, that's not what we've been told to look at. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever man satar al Muslim, whoever veils a believer, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will veil them in the honor because it's a fact that we are weak individuals. But you want to create problem, you want to create ikhtilaf, and you go around and you, you point these points out, and they're nonsense, they're just foolish points, which just are not necessary. 
The openness of the heart. Let me give you one example that gives you an understanding of the openness of the heart. Salman Farsi radiallahu anhu. He's a Persian. He's coming to Mecca and he's coming to Medina Munawwara. This was after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, I think. He had a friend, Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. And he wanted to get married and he found that there was a girl in a particular tribe and he said to Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, look, I'm a foreigner, you're the person of the area, take me along, you're my friend, take me along and propose to this, girl, this girl's family for me. So he said, okay, fine. With all honesty, he knew his friends. Right? They, they knew each other. They went there and Abu Darda radiallahu anhu said that you wait outside for a while, they don't know who you are, I'll go and speak to them, I'll lay the scene and then I'll bring you in. He said, okay, fine. So he's outside. And he's, then Abu Darda radiallahu is inside and Salman al-Farsi radiallahu is waiting outside and waiting and waiting. And eventually he comes out. Eventually he comes out and he says to him that my brother I went in there, I proposed for you, and they turned around, they said, you know, we don't know him, he's from somewhere else, we know you, you're a good guy, you know, you're a good person, why don't you get married to her? So I thought, okay, fine, I'll get married to her. <laughs> now, imagine that happened with you, with a good friend, imagine that happened with you, just put yourselves in that position. Your friend has never let you down, but this time, this is what happened. What would you do? Salman Farsi said, well, that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted, Mubarak to you. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted. She was written for you. That's the open-heartedness we need. And if we've got that open-heartedness, and the meanness comes out of our, ourselves, then believe me, most of the disagreements that we have will, will be diminished. We won't have them anymore. We can focus on higher aspects. And that's what the problem is. Why is it that in the last... 100 to 200 years is when we've been characterized with a downfall. Despite the fact that we've got people who consider to be reviving, you know, people who consider to get everybody in the Sahih Aqeedah as such. And, and before that, the Muslims were, mashallah, in great positions of uh, elevation around the world. There's something wrong, isn't it? If you're creating discord in the community, it may be just locally, but eventually it will have its repercussions on a, on a much higher level. And the whole Muslim Ummah suffers. I think we need to open up our hearts. And the other thing on, a, on an individual basis is a hadith that's related by Imam Bukhari in his Al-Adab Al-Mufrad. It says, ahaduhuma." <laughs> That when two people have loved each other, when two people have loved each other for the sake of Allah, they've been, they've been good friends for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then suddenly they notice that there is that there, there's discord between them, then it is because of a sin that one of them has committed. That's something that we need to look into. There's something else. There are valid places where sometimes we know when we get into a situation with certain people there's going to be an argument. What do you do about that? You know, if you have to go to a meeting, right, or to meet someone where you think you're going to get into an argument, be prepared, calm down. Number two, there's a dua, which is very powerful from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I want, you know, everybody can repeat it at least once with me, so you might be able to remember it. Allahumma, inni a'udhu bika, min ash-shiqaqi. وَالنِّفَاقِ وَسُوءِ الْأَخْلَاقِ That means, oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from disputation and quarreling. Disputation and quarreling. And hypocrisy, nifaq, hypocrisy. Shikaq, disputation and quarreling. Uh, nifaq is hypocrisy. وَسُوءِ الْأَخْلَاقِ Bad character. Because at the end of the day, all of this just goes back to bad character. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ash-shiqaqi wa nifaqi wa su'il akhlaq And then you'll be in a lot more control. And if you look at recent studies, what they've, what they've discovered, this is exactly what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. Subhanallah. When Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, when Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu, he was once in the fields and somebody got him very angry. So he sat down in the mud, 
was uh, irrigation of uh, agricultural land. He sat down in the mud, and he was still angry, and he, he, he lay down there. And he said, what are you doing? He said, this is what the Prophet Sallallahu told me, that if I get angry, I should sit down. And if, I, and if, if it doesn't subside, then I, I need to lie down. And recently what they found is that you're, uh, you, you're a lot more accepting of points. If you want to criticize somebody, make sure they're not standing up. <laughs> Seriously, there's been a research that, you know why uh, uh, they make you sit and relax on a shrink's chair? There, there, there's, a, there, there's a lot of uh, research behind that. If you, if you want to criticize somebody and they're standing up, they're more or less likely, they're less likely to accept that than if they're sitting down, than if they're lying down. So if you want to really get your point down to somebody, get them in that and give them a lot of fruit and, you know, mashallah, let them lie down and then give it to them. <laughs> They'll be a lot more accepting of that. <laughs> the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I mean, especially even now in the Arab lands, whenever there's a discord, you know, whenever somebody's getting a bit heated, salli ala nabi, salli ala nabi, it's just reminding them of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa you're thinking, why are they doing that? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was the greatest individual that ever lived that would bring people together and that was his greatest mission mm -hmm. and that's why you remember the Prophet Sallallahu that this was his way you're reminding both of them calm down relax follow the Sunnah don't be mean have good character respect the hurma of the other person respect the, the honor and the dignity of the other person And finally, how do the South Africans not have a difference of opinion when it comes to the moon issue? Despite the fact that they've got all the groups down there as well that we have here. It's just a practical solution. Just one idea of the moon issue. I'm just throwing it in. They all get together, all of the different groups. And if anybody disagrees that it should be Ramadan tomorrow, then just don't do it. If any one group says, okay, no, we don't agree with this. Okay, it's not done. We'll just do it the next day. And that's it. Everybody's happy. Because at the end of the day, doing it a day before somebody else, right? It's safer the other way around. This is more dangerous because at the end of the day, it's not Ramadan according to the other group. But if we go with the fact that one person doesn't disagree, that even though it's Ramadan, so we're going to go with it tomorrow for the sake of unity, then it's fine. That's just a proposal. It's for the moon sighting. It's for the moon sighting committees, and. That's something just for them to decide. I just couldn't resist but just talk about that because we're talking about ikhtilaf at the end of the day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up our hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us, give us wisdom to perceive the way to take issues forward in a positive way. To build on our, on our strengths and our differences. To build on them and to, to celebrate, uh, celebrate them in a proper way so that we can complement each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq and jazakumullah khair for all of you for staying uh, so long. Akhirul da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.